What does it mean to hold the identity of being Cham, an indigenous group in Southeast Asia? Even though I've been lucky to be surrounded by rich diversity, I still was surrounded by this narrative, this commentary that you guys came out of nowhere, you have no history, and you don't have a voice in some sense, right? You're not supposed to exist. And it's just, as a kid, I either hid internally, never talked about my identity growing up. Hi, I'm Dr. Raj Sundar, a family physician and a community organizer. You're listening to Healthcare for Humans, the show dedicated to educating you on how to care for culturally diverse communities so you can be a better healer. This is about everything that you wish you knew to really care for the person in front of you, not just a body system. Let's learn together. Welcome back to Healthcare for Humans. You just heard from Toipa, a social worker with a decade of combined experience in coalition building and organizational development. In today's episode, we're talking about the Cham community, an indigenous group spread across Vietnam, Cambodia, and Malaysia. The Cham people are one of 54 ethnic groups within Vietnam alone and helps us see what it means to have an identity that transcends nation-state boundaries. So what do I mean by that? Well, many communities around the world don't have a nation to call their own. One of the most prominent examples of communities whose historical territories transcend current national boundaries are Native American tribes. Take, for instance, the Duwamish, Navajo, Cherokee, among many, many others. These tribes possess distinct cultural identities deeply rooted in their ancestral lands. And their historical territories extend well beyond the confines of our current national boundaries and precede the establishment of modern nation states. The absence of a nation for indigenous tribes means we have a tendency to erase their identity as our current understanding predominantly revolves around the connection between culture, identity, and a physical homeland. This is also true for the Cham people. The Cham community has a rich and ancient history that stretches back over a millennium. The Cham people established a civilization along the coast of what is now central and southern Vietnam. They were known for their shipbuilding, seafaring, and created impressive architectures. Successive waves of invasions during this period led to the decline of the empire. Today, the Cham people are dispersed across different regions of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Malaysia, and are striving to preserve their cultural heritage and maintain their unique identity. I want you to know all of that for this episode. But ultimately, the point is not that you should know of every indigenous tribe or ethnic group in every nation, but recognize that identity can transcend national boundaries and know the indigenous group that you interact with in your life, where you live. This understanding is especially important for the people who hold the label Asian, which is a broad and overarching label that encompasses a vast array of different cultures and fails to capture the nuances and variations within the Asian continent. Yes, it's a continent, right? Being labeled an Asian can mean a lot of different things. I think of identity as a multifaceted tapestry woven from different threads, including religion, heritage, and personal experiences, sometimes linked to one's nation and sometimes not. You'll hear Toypa share today her experience identifying with Cham and Muslim more than Asian today. I hope all of us can honor these nuances because it'll help us better comprehend and engage with the complexity of human experiences. Without further ado, here's Toypa. Welcome to the show, Toypa. Hello. Tell me about yourself before we get started. Yeah, so my name is Toypa. I am a second generation Cham person from the Cham refugee community here in the greater Seattle area. Today's episode will focus on your identity, as you said, Cham refugee. You said that together. I want to clarify. I was going to just say Cham, but you said Cham refugee. Why did you use that specific terminology? Yeah. So I say that because there's a big difference when we talk about in general immigrant refugee communities is that refugees are a group of people who didn't necessarily want to leave. They're forced to leave. So I want to be very clear about that, that my family and my community 
came here during the Vietnam War. They were forced to leave. So I always bring that up. I'm second generation. I was born in America, but my parents are refugees. If they had it their way, they wouldn't have come to America. My family, my community are refugees due to the Vietnam War. And during that time as well, there was a lot going on with the Khmer Rouge. So my community was escaping the Vietnam War, as well as the Khmer Rouge at the same time. So they were fleeing literally for their lives and not knowing what was going to happen. Yeah. Let's talk about the identity of Cham. What does it mean to be Cham? Because Uh, I'm asking, it's, there's, I want the real answer, but let's uh start out with the definition answer too, which is, who are they? Because I don't think people actually know. A lot of people don't know who Cham people are. Yeah. So I would say Chom people are indigenous to the lands of Southeast Asia. The land that most people know nowadays is Vietnam and parts of Cambodia. So we're a smaller ethnic minority group, but we're one of the indigenous communities. And I say one because there's so many different ethnic groups out there that we just don't know about or we're not taught about. Yeah, yeah. When I read about the history, they were descendants of the people who once ruled the kingdom of Champa, mm. which existed from 7th to 15th centuries, and it was a major center of trade and culture, and actually had a significant impact on the development of Southeast Asian civilization overall. And they had a history of being conquered and ruled by many different empires, including Khmer, Vietnamese, and French, and they're now a minority group in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Malaysia. There's a large period of history where Vietnam specifically took over the kingdom of Champa. And because of that, people were either forced out or assimilated and in sometimes very violent ways. And there's a period of history where Cham people weren't fully welcomed into the country. The other note to make about people who identify as Cham is that there is a large percentage of people who are Muslim. And it combines Islam with traditional Cham beliefs and practices. So like mosques are often very beautiful and they say, quote unquote, impressive. How does that resonate with you? Oh, greatly. Because usually when I encounter people, they don't know the Chom community. Or if you do, that means you grew up around us and with us. That's usually the two folks I encounter in my lifetime. So that's like, thank you for saying all this. <laughs> We're not even the research. We have such a long, rich history. And I think what a lot of people learn about Southeast Asia is more so through the lens of the French colonization. And what I mean by that is not even learning about how France colonized Southeast Asia, but more so who has held the dominant narrative of the the history of Southeast Asia and has been the colonizers. And so no one hears about the Chom community, of the Chompa, our kingdom, because what people tend to ask me, oh, what country is it? And I'm like, we didn't have what we call a country. We had a kingdom way back in the day before all these borders were built by white Europeans coming in trying to tell us, like, this is how you're going to be now. We were all kingdoms, neighboring kingdoms with our own monarch, our own government, our own systems of rule. And ours was Champa, C-H-A-M-P-A. When I was growing up, you hear the Champa kingdom name. But as I got older, it really sunk into me, making me question, oh, internally in my community, we talk about our people in terms of kingdoms combating, again, the dominant narrative. But outside of my community, the way people would ask me questions like, what country is that really trying to force me into this box, this narrative only a very narrow lens of what they know, right? And that was problematic because I don't fit in any box that they've been fed to like in, in terms of main media, right? And just looking at me, the only no major countries are Cambodia. Are you Filipino? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and then they start going like, oh, are you Indian? Are... And then they start, they, are you Mexican? I thought it's legit. And it's so interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're only memeing really well-known countries. And it just shows me like, man, we really haven't been taught to really criticize, like, where is our lens coming from? How has it been shaped? And the way we pre-ask and approach and get to know other people, how is it in some ways oppressive onto the other people to misidentify them? Yeah, especially in conversations with indigenous communities. I think this understanding of your identity is linked to some artificial boundary of like mm-hmm. nation state boundary 
And if you're not part of the nation state boundary, like who are you? Is there an original nation state boundary? For, I can't even imagine <laughs> you could live in a place without, you know, you know what I mean? And I think for the Chom community, there's about 2 million people in Vietnam, Cambodia. And I think I want to emphasize that point that when somebody's from Vietnam, it doesn't mean they're Vietnamese. Like they could hold a lot of different identities. Do you ever say my family is from Vietnam? Yeah, I actually yeah. would tend to follow up saying my family is from Vietnam, but we're not Vietnamese. Just because yeah, yeah. it's that automatic, oh, you're Vietnamese then. Then they try to argue with me. I would say, no, I'm Chom. And they're like, no, you're Vietnamese because your family's from there. So that means their nationality. Like, First off, hold on. I wasn't born in Vietnam. I've only been once in my whole entire life. And to just simply erase the fact that I said, no, I'm not, just really shows like, why are you trying to place certain identity upon me just because you can't comprehend or understand? What Can I know what those reactions are if you feel comfortable sharing? Here's the thing. I grew up and raised in America. My parents, they have U.S. citizenship. So to also erase that identity away from us, that we are also American in our own way, in our own right, it just shows, wait, are you saying that we also don't have roots here in this country, in this land, even though we're forced to come here? And then to also say, place an identity on us that has been um, oppressive. And like you talked earlier about the colonization. So we had a kingdom, but of course, the neighboring kingdoms we battle it out for land or power or whatever. Even though that has happened so long ago in like ancient times, there's still this feeling of you're still trying to conquer me. It was like, first off, no, we have our own language. We have our own history. We are on our people. So that comes up for me on one. And the other people are like, wait, I don't know what that is. Some curiosity. Is this going to be a conversation? Is this going to be yeah. an argument or a debate? Let's see our tones here. Some people genuinely have not heard. So I got to give grace with that. I've never heard of the Trump community before. Just tell me more. I've had people who really has politely just asked or to say thank you so much for sharing that information with me. There's a way to approach that with kindness. I also want to reflect back. That was a powerful analogy to talk about what is being conquered now feels like where another identity is imposed on you. Right. So some context for folks who are listening, because this month is Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander month. We don't acknowledge the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities enough. Right. That's a fact. But in the Asian American community, even most people in that community are Chinese, Indian, Japanese, Korean, maybe some Filipino. So we forget, actually. The Asian American community is also large and quite diverse by themselves. There's a way to categorize this for people to have general understanding of what this means. East Asians are Chinese, Japanese, Korean, you can say Taiwanese. South Asian is India, Bangladesh, Pakistani. Southeast is Burmese, Cambodia, Filipino, Malaysia, Vietnamese. There's different countries, which is obvious. But today, we're really focusing on even within a country, there's a lot of diversity that's important for people to know. So you're not imposing that country's identity onto indigenous population or smaller populations who live there. So, Toipa, that was a brief rant. But <laughs> reflecting back on your personal experience growing up as somebody who holds a Cham identity, how did it feel... Being in a, like a minority within the Asian community in many ways, right? It's interesting because growing up, I have been really lucky enough and blessed to have been surrounded by such diversity that really also showcased some of my culture. I grew up with the East African community who are also, you mentioned like some Somali patients who are Muslim. So it's interesting because I would tell people I didn't consider myself Asian until college. And the reason why, because you mentioned it, being a minority within a minority, right? Being an ethnic minority within another minority group, but also intersect that with my religion, being belonging to a Muslim community, practice Islam. And it's just there wasn't anyone else that looked like me around me that was both Asian and Muslim at the same time. But I would connect more so with my East African peers, my Somali peers, and or even other cultural elements because a lot of my Asian friends were third generation. 
while again, my other peers were Ethiopian or Somali, right? They were second generation or also from the refugee community. So we connected more culturally. So it was a really interesting identity developed for myself. I felt, to be honest, really removed from the Asian community. We went through different things in our homes and what was acceptable. I come from a very traditional household. There's like very traditional patriarchy gender roles. But it's just like certain things where I wasn't allowed to mix with the opposite gender. Well, my other friends, to have friends who are guys. But then for me, I had to navigate differently. And my other peers who are Somali, that we get it. Like we get it. Like we don't have to say it. And also what contributed to me not identifying as Asian growing up is that I kept hearing the narrative that from other Asians, particularly, I will say this from the Vietnamese community, we would hear people say we came out of nowhere to their land. Like we were the outsiders. And my sister had an experience where one time she was, I think, on campus at the University of Washington with a friend as she was meeting a mutual friend or something for the first time. And he's, oh, wait, you're Trump. I thought you guys don't exist at all. And he was very, like, adamant about that. You guys don't exist. You're extinct. I know. And she was like, sorry for existing. How did you reincarnate and come here right How did now? You <laughs> so, you know, so growing up, when you have, even though I've been lucky to be surrounded by rich diversity in South Seattle, but I still was surrounded by this narrative, this commentary that, you guys came out of nowhere, you have no history, and you don't have a voice in some sense, right? You're not supposed to exist. And it's just, as a kid, I either hid internally, never talked about my identity growing up until I got older to college. And I think some people will have the experience of, well, we were taught to assimilate and keep quiet and whitewash ourselves, right? I actually had it so lucky that my community, we're very prideful in our identity. That we're like, no, I will forever say I'm a child Muslim American before I would say I'm Asian because they taught me at an early age that like, this is who you are. And at home, right, you speak them. Don't ask me to speak because I was like, oh, my. <laughs> it's so embarrassingly bad now. But as I got older, but yeah, I give praise to my community, my elders for instilling in us like who we are at a very early age. Because you're a Tom and you're Muslim, or you're Muslim and you're Tom. Don't hide from that. That's who we are. That's, I would say, my community is the one that really stirred me to the path of social work on supporting, helping others, because that's of the teaching of Islam, right? You live within your means, but you always are doing the best to better the community and to support everybody else around you at the same time. And social work was the only career that really resonated with me because of the teachings and the values I have from growing up in my community. But yeah, so... I've just been so lucky my community instilled that within me. There's also have stories where you might meet some Chom people who have a Vietnamese last name. And that has to do with what you mentioned earlier, assimilation for survival. I don't blame those folks because you do what you do to survive. But I also have relatives who are hardcore. No, we're keeping our Arabic name. We are not changing anything. So I just have to say there's a strong resilience and pridefulness and just that's really powerful. Um, I have to give kudos to my elders for instilling that in me early on that I know who I am. And I didn't realize until I got to college and I got to my social work program, meeting other students who were on their own journey of just owning their identity and uh, relearning their roots. And I'm still learning about what is the history of our people. But I was really blessed. I didn't realize until college, was like this is one of the areas that I feel like was a gem for me, especially that really prepared me to be strong and advocating for myself, my people, or other communities who have been marginalized. Like, how do we stay true to our voice? Especially when I was doing youth work, I would tell youth, do not westernize your name. If you can pronounce these complicated European names for Hollywood celebrities, we can say all this, okay? We can say your name. You correct me. And it was also a way to show young people, you have the power as well to correct me as an, as your elder, that I also have a place for growth. Like this is to respect you and who you are when you come into like, when we come into space with each other. There's so many parts to that I want to repeat back to you. One is, I think about identity and that we all hold a multitude of identities. Mm -hmm. 
we have the choice and autonomy to choose what fits for us. So it's yeah. mostly about the person choosing that for themselves. So people who are interacting with you, the problem is that they're imposing an Asian identity on you. You may or may not, right? There might be some Trump people who are like, yeah, I'm Asian, right? Yeah. And that's fine. But that's not how you identify. And so it's important to respect people's layers of identity and what they grew up identifying with or feeling close to because of values, beliefs, whatever it was. For you, it was Cham and also Islam because mm -hmm. of common experience and shared values there. And the two is about being a minority within a minority, right? We talk about the Khmer Rouge. We've talked about it even mm -hmm. in this podcast and how the Cambodian people have suffered a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to support that community. But when you're a minority within a minority, we don't think about other people within that community. Oh, completely. There's a reason why, even though, like, obviously, like, the U.S. now versus 50 years ago looks completely different. And you hit it earlier, like, my intersecting identities really created a, a lens of how I view and approach the world. What I mean by that is, I can't only see my work or who I'm interacting with only the lens as a femme person or an Asian person, as a woman, as a daughter, or second generation, or whatever. I can't because there's so many other layered identities connected to it. And I forgot to also mention spiritual identity. In terms of, yeah, the Asian community, the, the dominant narrative is that most Asians are not Muslim. Even though the largest Islamic country is an Asian country. So I, yeah, because when we talk about social justice work. And it's been interesting in some spaces are people who are now just coming into realizing how oppressive systems are, right? That we always tend to view things from we're always the victim lens. And for some folks of color, and I'm just like, hold on, stop. Yes, there's a whole long history of colonization from white communities on communities of color. But have we also looked at other communities of color have their history of colonization, oppression, and violence. Let's look deeper. There has been. Are we also acknowledging that not only have we been hurt, but could we cause the same amount of damage and hurt onto other communities? Some friends of mine weren't ready to have that conversation. And then some years later, I just realized my ancestors are the oppressors. So it's really interesting that we don't talk enough about what is the complex history there in relation to one another. We've been almost named as completely non-existent. We're visible. We had communities who had tried to literally wipe us out in a way any written document. So we're just not there at all. But we don't have enough of those conversations. And where do we talk deeper in terms of those systems of power? Where is that contract coming from? How harmful it is it, right? Yeah, I think it's an important lens because now we've been all lumped into white and BIPOC. I know. <laughs> hey, I'm BIPOC too. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, you can be a, I didn't do anything. <laughs> let's, let's talk briefly, or as much as you want, about the richness of Cham tradition. I want to talk about what memories you have, what you still think of as quote unquote home, like that feeling of these are my yeah. people staying, right? Yeah, it's a mix. And the thing with culture is interesting that it changes over time and generations, especially now we're in America. Chong folks here versus Chong folks in Vietnam or the way my parents were raised, completely different. And it's going to probably change in the next generation after me. I think the biggest thing when you talk about the Chong community or for me is just the gatherings. I think most folks will say that, right? For what weddings, for example, I always tell people this, that it's a very communal thing. Weddings are embedded in my memory because you would have the grandmas who were the head chef, meaning they're the ones who dictate the menu on how certain things will get cooked. They are the lead in command for this wedding, for the food. Now, the people who help cook the food are all the aunties and the uncles, whoever is around, not just family, blood relatives, but anyone in the community. And we have this, I would say this like, beef, like a thick stew back in the day before we had pre-shredded coconut, like you would shred the actual coconut by hand on this like wooden, still with a metal like ring on the end to scrape the coconut as you're rounded overnight with a big pot. 
like legit it's like huge because you're feeding the masses you're feeding the whole entire community but what's like wonderful about it everyone pitches in just tra- drop by the wedding house and pitches where they can and when we redo for like bridal nights the desserts you would hit up certain people in the community who are known for certain types of desserts and dishes and they come together and cook everyone has a role and the men are cooking all night long i don't know how late they might get like a two-hour nap in if they're lucky or something and like the younger kids, I did the sweet. Like I, I knew how to cut certain things a certain way. For all, and I was able to pass that knowledge on to the next generation. So I would say food is number one. And I think also the way we dress. So again, I mentioned with Muslim, there's a different way we would change our outfits. And our traditional outfits are very colorful. And in Southeast Asia, there's always gold everywhere. And the way we wear yeah. our hijabs in Vietnam is it wasn't like full coverage where some people when I know like you cover your neck and everything. It was really different. So there's certain even clothing that they don't make anymore that I grew up with. And I regret not trying to convince my mom to buy more of this to keep almost like artifacts. So there's just like certain things that was like a blend of both the Southeast Asian culture and the Islamic culture together for my upbringing. Yeah, it sounds incredibly delicious. And I think communal, right? Um, I can imagine everybody contributing for this wedding and people coming together and chipping in. And I think that's a way to do a celebration. Okay, the last part of this episode that I wanted to cover was about you receiving healthcare. Maybe I'll start out, we've talked about identity a lot. How has it shaped how you've received healthcare in a way that has been helpful or maybe not? Don't know how it's affected it when you've had interactions with healthcare system throughout your life. Yeah, so... Bless my mom. I don't know how she did it. As a refugee woman who barely spoke English, she navigated the healthcare system somehow with a family, making sure that we were at all our doctor's and dentist appointments. I don't know how she did it. And also navigating social services and making sure that it was paid too. We were fortunate. I actually grew up with neighbor care. And there were one of the very few spaces I saw like Southeast Asian artwork on the walls. I believe it was the embroidery from the Hmong community on the walls. And I, I grew up with that, seeing that all the time. And so I got older, I was like, oh, I recognize this artwork because I seen it in my healthcare clinic as a child. And the fact that I was very Southeast Asian, I could see the details of it. I was like, I was being seen by the healthcare clinic in that way. And this particular healthcare clinic, there were a couple of folks who I believe were able to provide in-person translation for my mom, but most of the time not. I had to push her to like, hey, was there an interpreter? Do you understand what's going on here? Can you explain it to me? If not, then who can? Well, there's still a push and struggle for it. And I think because for me, like I mentioned earlier, being so blessed to have been raised in a community who valued on um, holding your identity at the center to not let other narrative and dominant culture influence that. You know, to always have a translator for us. You know that we're Muslim because they have Muslims on staff as their medical assistants. And my aunt was one. And I would recognize one of the providers who was down and stuff. Or we would recognize the same Vietnamese or Khmer translator who's been there for like over 20 years or something. <laughs> right? Because yeah. they know the community needs them. That was like, their, it's like they're the life support. They're the bridge between the systems. And that shows you if they leave, oh man, I don't know what would happen. It's really hard. And again, I'm very privileged where I can navigate some of those things because I speak English and I know what are my rights. And I'm very the opposite. uh, I would say the older generation who was also taught to stay quiet, don't cause trouble because we don't get kicked out of this country because we don't have citizenship yet because we're refugees. When my grandpa was alive, he had a doctor's appointment. I specifically wrote for an interpreter and when I showed up with my grandparents to the doctor's appointment, they were like, oh, get rid of the interpreter. And I'm like, I don't speak Vietnamese. Like, grandparents speak Vietnamese. I could barely speak them. I speak English. So I was so upset. I, I for sure complained. And the doctor was like, rude. I'm still seeing that struggle now in healthcare clinics with my family. And it's very frustrating. What's the gap? Most places have interpreters, right? I think there's a part of both language and cultural interpretation, maybe. I guess like some clinics do it well, others don't. We all know that if you've interacted with those clinics. But where's the gap? Because it took a while for people to acknowledge interpreters are important, right? I don't know how that was ever possible, but I think people acknowledge that. So mostly I see access either through in-person or some 
industrialized solution with the video cams or c- connecting to a bigger uh, interpreter service. But you're right. I personally have seen patients leave some of my visits and I'm like, I don't know if they fully understood what I was trying to communicate either because there's one type of interpretation where they are being culturally responsive, get the message across from what I'm saying. There's another where they cut out a lot of things that I'm saying. They self-filter because they're like, oh, they won't get it anyway. I'm not going to say it. So I, as a provider, sometimes I'm in that place of I don't know what to do next. And how do I best support either systems or this individual interaction? So, for example, when your mom, let's say I talk about diabetes and hypertension for 20 minutes. After that visit, I can be like, yeah, like, I think we both understood each other. And how do I make sure to get to that point? Oh, that's a good one. I appreciate you breaking it down. What is the gap? Especially, you know, interpretation is needed, but it's more than just that, right? Is how does your patient in front of you grasp what health means to them? I think in terms of healthcare in the U.S., we have such a Western lens on it. We treat the symptoms, but we don't really truly treat the wholeness of the person. And now we're seeing just such connection between the mind and the physical and the emotional, all of it together. And I would say, here's the thing. I come from a refugee community. And if you can't see the threat, it's not a threat, right? And you can't see the ailments within your body. I'm fine. I can still physically get up. So I'm completely fine. Fine. What does health mean to them? I think that's the thing that's in terms of the cultural gap. Like, how do you understand your patient coming in? And how do you communicate in some phrases or use certain words that's going to resonate with them? Talking about diabetes. Yes, you could take your medicine. They know to take pills for a certain time. Because that's doctor's orders. They have it. My mom has it. But my mom still doesn't grasp the fact that we should use less sodium in your food, even though fish sauce is in everything in Southeast Asian food. Maybe there is a bigger conversation, again, with interpreters understand the importance of like how to translate certain things across. And there's also for interpreters or the patients to their medical staff, you're going to give me scientific stuff I'm not going to remember. But if you're going to tell me that I need to cut out fish sauce out of my diet, I'm going to remember that. And I need to know why. It has to be a really good reason why. I need to cut it out. And how do we talk about health in a different way versus from the science? I think once you get to know the community the patient comes from, like their culture and everything like that, then you might have a better way of, okay, how do I approach the topic on this and this to make sure they leave here understanding why I recommended this or something like, yeah, because a lot of time they don't know. They're just like, oh, we just do it because we're told. That's it. And here's another thing too. When I said that something triggered within me was that We're not taught to critically analyze and analyze anything. And I think for some patients, for folks from certain immigrant refugee communities, they're not taught to question anything back. They're just taught to, okay, as is, be fed as is. And my parents' generation were taught that. I, on the other hand, was like, wait, I need to know more information. So here's another thing, too. This is where I experienced this as a language barrier, not only that I don't speak Jam as well, but the language barrier that I encounter with my, my elders, we have a different way of speaking. I'm very direct and blunt. They have more of a roundabout way of talking. My uncle would describe it like, we have a more flowery language when you approach to explaining things. I was like, that's a good point. I have a very direct, blunt way that comes off as really harsh. I can't speak the language, my native tongue anymore as much. But the way I approach my conversation with some of my elders that really puts a gap between us. So maybe that's something also we need to go beyond like direct language. But how are we presenting information? How is our tone of voice? And how are they interpreting what we're saying, the way we're presenting information? Yeah, all excellent points. And I think you talked about it very eloquently. But my question then is, okay, so let's go back to the situation that I was talking about, where I want to have a little more confidence in what's been communicated. I think there's a gap in how clinicians communicate, right? Let's go back to hypertension. This medical diagnosis that is supposed to be defined as high blood pressure. And then you're like, what is blood pressure? Because when you talk about blood, people think of different things. So you need like probably a good analogy or metaphor. It would be nice if the clinician was using plainer language and could have a conversation with the interpreter, because I think this is a Western paradigm where they're not supposed to be in the room, 
right? They're just here as a third party interpreting, but it'd be interesting to use them as a cultural navigator at the same time, right? Yeah, yeah. There's this concept of high blood pressure, which is your blood vessels are, have high pressure and they're going to lead to stroke and heart attacks. Can you help me? What are some analogies that could help interpreter? And they'd be like, hey, like, what about this? There's, I don't know. I don't know if that captures it. Why don't we use the second one? Okay. Yeah. Say that to the patient. Okay. Did they get it? Because actually, sometimes I can see the patient when they get it and they don't get it. Yeah, yeah. There's almost a, like a realization that goes over their whole body. Oh, like, like, I get it. Like, why? That would make sense. So achieving that reaction is almost like an outcome that I'm seeking. I do yeah. feel like I haven't thought about it enough. But just the current way we're doing it sometimes misses that. Because this is a common occurrence, not just the appearance. Like a lot of times I have visits with patients that have had a diagnosis for five years. They just say, I take the medication because the doctor told me to. <laughs> and I'm taking it, so it must be fine. Because <laughs> you told me to take it and I take it. <laughs> right. like, not you're taking like, it. You're right. I'm glad you're taking it. Like it's a little more complicated. And the second part that stuck with me is that it's one thing to say, you have high blood pressure, we need to decrease the salt. It's another thing to say, you do have high blood pressure, we somehow communicate that. And what could be helpful is cutting down the fish sauce. And they're like, oh, yeah, I eat a lot of fish sauce. You really want me to do that? I'm like, yeah, like a little bit. It has a lot of sodium. I don't need you to give it up. It's clearly an important part of your food. I gotta say that too, because sometimes people leave up saying, the doctor told me to not eat fish sauce. Who is this guy? Like, how am I gonna eat any of my food? <laughs> so it's like, being specific enough to incorporate people's whole identity of what's important to them and also not asking them to give it up, right? As you're saying, the whole health, there's probably a conversation we can have that, but how do you do that effectively? You know what? I think the fact that the only times I hear providers approaching this, like really authentically wanting to make sure they're supporting and serving their patients from this lens are, most of them are doctors of color from the community. And you always ask this question, how can we better approach talking to our patients who are especially from different cultures than our own? I think it's smart and responsible to have that relationship with interpreters. Hey, your role is really important. I understand that you're not supposed to stray off the narrative, but is there an agreed upon where you can talk about metaphors? Please navigate me. I'm really pressing you. You're right. There's a power dynamic with the doctor and the patient, but also with the interpreter. Because some of some folks might be like, you're the doctor. You tell me what to do. And I can't go against the rules. No, go back and break the rules because who set the rules? The people who set the rules are folks who don't look like us, who don't understand our struggles. And so, again, let's push back. And I think your approach of just let me talk to the interpreter. We use these metaphors. We'll, we'll have the interpreter have buy-in into this conversation of the patient's health. I think it's going back. The patient's health, there's a whole community structured around it. It's not just you as the provider. You need the interpreter. But I say, yeah, how are we not just talking about the facts, but how are these information interpreted? How is it hitting, right? Because like you said, you can explain in English. You talk about high blood pressure, you're going to lose me. Unless you're talking about how does it feel within my body? What's causing it and what's long-term? And how does it connect to my values? And I would say this also, just because I'm a woman of color, we never center ourselves. We're taught to center our families and everyone around us. We're taught to take care of everybody, right? We don't hear enough about, you know what? Your family is important. I hear that. But your family can't be there without you. So you need to take care of yourself. For my mom would be, if anything happens to her, oh my gosh, I wouldn't not know what would happen to my family. She takes care of so many people. That ricochets out. If she was to fall sick and then if she can't watch these young kids, their parents can't go to work, pay the bills. She can't watch my grandma, check in with my uncles, make sure that they meet their appointments and they get their medication and things like that. It ricochets out. How are we talking about healthcare? Not just only the individual in terms of physical element of what they're feeling and talk about holistically. I come holistically outside of their bodies and how it ricochets the people around them. I come from a community where, and this also stems in the teaching of Islam, that it's not about the individual. We're part of a larger system. And I think that's beautiful because my role is really crucial to this other person or to someone I never met before. And how do you talk about healthcare in that way? It might shift your paradigm to something like, oh, okay, this might be the solution so we've be been looking for. I think the birthplace of Western medicine, which has spread throughout the world, is this individualistic nature, 
right? Yeah. We can unpack that history, but it is that based on one-on-one -on -one visits and I'm treating this individual. So that relationality and interconnectedness is almost never there. I mean, it's acknowledged, but that's not the core of it, right? I'm taking care of you and your family and community through this interaction. That's so much more powerful if you actually approach it through that lens. But nobody's trained that way, and our systems really are designed to be that way. And then two of what you said of there's component of acknowledging and honoring the culture and beliefs and values that a community holds of, hey, as an Asian woman, you've centered everybody around you your whole life. Maybe not. But the expectation has been there in different forms. I want you to be healthy because it'll help you take care of others better. There's like honoring that expectation, but challenging it at the same time. But like, it's also important for you to be well. And I, as your doctor, want you to be well, healthy and happy. And I don't know if other people say that to you, but I do. And you have to do that respectfully, right? Because I think in the Native Hawaiian episode that we did with Dr. Miley Tolley, this came out pretty explicitly where I said something about how we talk about living longer all the time. And she was like, that's not really going to resonate with a lot of people because we're already suffering in so much. And just saying like, you're going to live a lot longer. That could be, oh, like, that's not a great selling point. But if you say, hey, I want you to live longer to pass on your wisdom to the next generation. And that is something really meaningful. So navigating this honoring and challenging when appropriate, I think. But yeah, that's a good point is like, we're approaching health in a way we come in with our own assumptions of what we might think a patient might hear that's valuable. Like you said, a long life. No, we need to put healthy and happy. That's more valuable. How do you talk about, I want you to live a life with little pain as possible, little mm -hmm. suffering as possible. Oh, how does it feel to not have your ankles hurt all the time when you're walking, when you're having to stand on your for your job or your caretaking? How do you feel to not pull your back? And some of them may have never know what that might feel like. And they probably have never been asked that before. So it's probably important. It's really crucial at times with a patient and a doctor relationship. You're in a position where you could actually, you have their ear. Here, I know I'm your doctor, but you know your body. I don't. Help me figure out how to help you. I want you to live a life where there's like little pain as possible. So you could do what you can and hopefully use less medication, see me less, right? And phrase it that way that gives them the power. Because again, I think also with healthcare, in terms of patient doctor relationships, it's always doctor, you tell me what to do and I'll do it. And what's also the patient's responsibility that they, how do you empower the patient to take control of their health? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Last thoughts? I appreciate you opening this conversation because, again, I mentioned earlier, my layered of identities really informs me of how I move through this world, right? Because I'm not going to just approach it through only one lens. Like, I have to acknowledge, like, I have so multiple identities. How has that impacted me? How does others people see me? And then how does that inform how to approach it? How do we build that trust? And within this month of May, of how do we talk about inclusivity of communities who are never part of the conversation or who are immediately out of the conversation, right? And I appreciate a provider like you is actually taking time to hear stories. How do I take this in with patients? You might not have a John patient, but you might have someone who has similar identities as the John community. Or, and I also want to note something too, that with each generation, there's mixings of communities, culture changes. So how are you also acknowledging that there's crossover with communities? We talk about there's such diversity in the diaspora of the Asian community, the mixing of the native community, the indigenous community, the Chinese community, and the Filipino community. We don't talk about that enough. And how about those folks who hold those identity? Are they also being seen when they're going to certain social services? Because we understand there's been so much mixing because Communities do not stay the same. Culture changes. It will always happen. But how as we are we in a role of providing ser services to people or recognizing that and making sure we're holding ourselves accountable to be very adaptable to that change? Yeah, well said. Thank you, Taifa, for joining Thanks. us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks again, everyone, for joining me on another episode of Healthcare for Humans. If you like this episode, as always, my ask to you is please share it with one other person so they can also hear it. I'll see you next time. 
This podcast is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not represent any of the participants' past, current, or future employers unless explicitly expressed as so. Always seek advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with regards to your own personal questions about what medical conditions you may be experiencing. This Healthcare for Humans project is based on Duemish land and makes a regular commitment to real rent Duemish.